do is to start and use on our Washington speaker, Eleanor? No. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I'm doing technical here. If for only one thing, waving a braille computer around myself. So here we go. Okay. This session is called Multiple Identity eh, Identities, Ordinary Lives. Disabled women's rights are human rights. Now, is this the one you're all expecting? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nodding's not an option, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Fantastic. Well, we're going to talk about the challenges, and I will say the fabulousness of being disabled feminist women. Okay. So, we're going to explore activism as feminists and disabled women. What unites us with non-disabled feminists, and what divides us? Um, we're going to talk a bit about our place both as disabled and feminists and how can we work together for positive change. So I'm going to pre briefly introduce the panel. Um, on Skype we have, um, oh, sorry I just misled your name, sorry. Needy. Needy, okay I'll introduce you properly later. Uh, on the platform here with me we have Francis, Becca and Becky. Oh, well, yes. Francis, Becky and Becca, in that order, left to right, for those of you who want to know. Or, of course, it's your right to left. Oh, I think I might go home. <laughs> right. Okay. So there we go. That's that's what we're doing today. But before we start, I'd like to say a big thank you to Eleanor Lisley, who has put this together and has been the mistress mind behind the shaping of this, the dragging out of various folks from all over the world to come and contribute and this is her vision of, of um, a panel. And I would like to hand over to her to say a few words before we begin. Hello everyone, thank you for so much for coming. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm not on the panel is because I thought I'd be needed to troubleshoot, and I do. So I'm really, really grateful for all the people who are here on the panel, because as you know, it's Sunday traveling, it's a bit difficult, and uh, and thank you all for, for being here to support this. Um, you will find that the, the reason why we called the different people here is they all have different stories as well as personal stories and personal journeys as disabled women and how um, how they are also how feminism also shape it and have not helped sometimes with being disabled women but I'll leave it back to Kirsten fantastic okay um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have the contributions first and then we're going to throw it open to questions and comments from you and there'll be somebody trotting around the room with a with a microphone. Do I need to say anything about uh, text-to-speech or anything like that? Is that everything? All that working? Yes. Speech-to-text, yes. sorry, the other way around. Oh, you know what I mean. Okay, fantastic. All right then. Um, Okay, so uh, <coughs> so first, I'd like to um, to play the video from Needy Goyal from India. She's in Mumbai. She's down with us on Skype at the moment, but we thought we'd play the video and then she can listen in to comments and the other um, and the other contributions later. So, Ellen, would you like to wave your data to you?
A very good afternoon to all of you. I am Nidhi Goyal from Mumbai, India. First of all, I would like to thank, well, I would like to start by thanking the conference organizers and sisters of Frida, and for all of you um, for giving me this opportunity to speak at this conference. So today I'm here as a disability and gender rights activist, as a disabled feminist, but I'd like to take you back to a point where I began. I began with a transition uh, from a non-disabled teenager to, into someone who acquired an irreversible incurable eye disorder, which will ultimately render her blind. So people ask me, oh, you know, that transition, that, that acquiring a disability would have been traumatizing, right? Yes, it was, and it would be then. Uh, but what I really remember from that experience is the irony that as I was going blind, the blindness was further opening my eyes. I could see, observe, and experience things that I wouldn't have experienced otherwise. So I saw that this lovely city, which I love a lot, which I loved before and I love now, and as well as the safest cities in India, I saw that how it was very unwelcoming um, to a person with a disability then, in the early 2000s. I saw that it was unwelcoming because there was a lack of access. Access to transportation, access to education, access to employment, access to social spaces. Um, I saw that an educational institute, which would very warmly welcome a non-disabled student with the right qualifications, would obligingly and grudgingly take in or accept, quote unquote, um, a disabled student with a similar qualification. I saw that a uh, society that was very not empathetic, but sympathetic and pity, pitying towards my parents would pity them more because there was a daughter and she was disabled. I saw that the Bollywood cinema, that most of us Indians like a lot, had no place for representation of a person like me, so a person who was disabled. Um, if there was a representation, it was as a burden. It was someone who constantly needed care and would be a care receiver. It would be someone who would, as a representation, would never be quote unquote, accepted in love. I grew up in such an environment, but I grew, I uh, endured, and I succeeded. But this was not just because of my inner strength. It was because I was privileged. I had the privilege of being from urban India. I had the privilege of being from middle class. I had the privilege of speaking English. I had the privilege of having an educated, very, very supportive um, parents and family, a structure that helped me lean back on them in a country where social security is zero, which is next to me. Um, this made me realize that not every woman with a disability has this kind of support that I have, this kind of privilege that I have. And that's when I decided that I would work towards changing the ethos or altering the environment for women with disabilities. <clears throat> Sorry. As, um, after acquiring a mass media degree and working as a journalist for a couple of years, um, all through which I had noticed that the women's rights movement and the disability rights movement left a gap in between. The gap through which the woman with a disability slipped downwards. Um, no one heard her. And that's when I decided that I would work with mainstream women's rights organizations and work with them on issues of women with disabilities. I started my work with Point of View um, and their partners, Kriya, who pioneered an online initiative called sexualityanddisability.org. By then, there were NGOs, DPOs, organizations, government, working on rehabilitation, working on access, education, employment, etc., etc. But none were really giving a thought about gender components of disabilities. None were obviously talking about sexual and reproductive health and rights. When we started working in this area, the first thing that we received was a lot of black was a lot of resistance, because especially according to the disability rights groups and disabled activists, this was sexual rights, that is, was a non-issue, complete non-issue, or an absolutely superfluous one, because it wasn't necessary, according to them, to a person with a disability or for his or her survival. Um, over the years, we launched the website in 2012, which speaks about sexual rights of women with disabilities. And over the years, we've managed to reach around 250,000 visitors. And that speaks volumes. For the past one year, we've also taken this initiative offline 
and has started reaching women at their homes, at organizations, at their institutes, etc. And started talking to them about how they would relearn or rediscover their own sexuality and sexual rights. Um, this is an initiative that's been going on for the past four, four and a half years. And one of our key roles, other than supporting the women with disabilities and providing information, is also to create public awareness, uh, to change to alter the environment and ethos, as I mentioned. But um, going back to the policy level, where you know, a trickle-down effect is absolutely necessary from the policy and legal level. Um, so in India, there is a new disability act, upcoming disability act, um, to hold up the UNCRPD, uh, to uphold the UNCRPD rather. Uh, and uh, that disability act shockingly missed out again on women with disabilities. So a group of us, um, a few disabled feminists, decided to lobby with the government. And just to, it speaks volumes that where um, disabled feminists in the early 90s, late 90s, were very handful and were sporadically making efforts to bring this discourse in the public, we managed to elicit a huge response from the community, from activists and organizations when we said that we wanted a separate chapter on women with disabilities in the upcoming act. We approached the ministry, so we approached our department, the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities, under whose jurisdiction was this act. But we also approached the other ministries. We spoke to the Ministry of Women and Child Development, to the Ministry of Labor and Employment, to uh, the Health Ministry, etc., to bring to notice how intersectionality plays a huge, huge role in this act and in the lives of women with disabilities, as in many other cases. Well, we received mixed responses. We, um, we received empathetic responses from you know, someone like a Ministry of uh, Women who was completely outraged at the clauses that restricted and prohibited reprodu reproductive rights of women with disabilities to uh, some negative responses where uh, bureaucrats and policymakers accused us of being discriminatory and uh, trying to separate and segregate women with disabilities from the mainstream persons with disabilities or the group or the constituents. Well, we keep kept our fingers crossed, but with the kind of lobbying that we managed to do, hopefully things will move forward soon. But that, my working experience in India, um, and uh, uh, the, my associations with the rest of the world, so my work with disabled feminists in the UK, my presentations and talks at various conferences and institutes, etc., have taught me that there is a huge global resonance to issues. And that is why my activism at the global level, and I think all of us need to do this, uh, is a very two-part activism. So one, um, the main agenda of the activism, of the two parts, is to seal that gap between which the woman with disability was living. So I've been working um, at the ASEAN level, the Southeast Asian level, uh, and partly at the, uh, in, in the other areas of the globe, where, um, where I'm training disability rights activists who are working on access and other issues on understandings of gender, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and pushing for how to advocate for these areas of disability. On the other hand, I'm working with organizations like AWIT, Association for Women's Rights and Development, where um, we're working to create an integrated space uh, in the feminist mainstream events like the International Forum where women with disabilities can find their voice, can find them access. What we really need to do is to collaborate. Not only disabled feminists from all over the globe, but we really need to collaborate the non-disabled feminists with the disabled feminists. Not only because of the collective power that we find, but it's amazing if non-disabled feminists uh, can, can accept disability as a diversity within the feminist movement. That caste, caste religion is a so is disability. Uh, like feminist movements, for feminist conferences like this one today, has offered an equal space with respect for a woman with a disability or a disabled feminist. Similarly, in our movements, if we found space, it also helps, and this is through experience, it also helps push the identity, the dignity, and respect for a woman with a disability within the disability rights space. So our 
One point motto should be integration, collaboration, and working together. With this, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That that was that was really interesting. Um, so things around collaboration, a lot of the issues are very similar for women across the world. Um, issues around working together are very important. Thank you very much. So um, and I completely forgot to uh, introduce Needy properly. Uh, so you've just heard from Needy Goyle. She says, oh, I've just lost it. Sorry. Oh. She's a disability, gender, and sexual rights activist, committed to changing the lives of disabled women, is internationally known researcher, activist, writer, trainer, campaigner, working across language, languages, genders, geographies, impairments, and all other forms of marginalization. So there we go, that's what she gets up to. And so thank you very much, Needy. So we're now going to, um, we're now going to momentarily, we're going to hear from um, Usher, Professor Usher Hans, who we still not managed to reach by Skype, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's obviously the technology in, in Washington DC is problematic. <laughs> anyway, she's a former professor of political sciences and gender studies in university in, in India. She's taught and carried out research in India, the United States, Canada, and the UK. She's the co-founder of SMRC. I don't know what that stands for, but it's a disability people's organization in India. What's that stand for? I don't know, do you know? No, but Marine, right? <laughs> do you know what that stands for? No. <laughs> okay, it's an important organization that we don't know what it's doing. Kirsten. Yes, uh, do you know what it stands for? It stands, it stands for Shanta Memorial Rehabilitation Centre. Fantastic, thank you very much. Well, so, well, Usher well, has worked on issues well, of gender well, and disability at national and international level. She's written books on gender and disability advice on addressing disability rights, in particular in relation to disasters and emergency planning. Okay, so this is Asha Hans. Hi everyone, it's good to be part of your great meeting. I just bring a few thoughts on violence against women and disabilities to all of you. And um, this is something that has been a core concern for many, many years, when even as a student, my master's degree is uh, working against dowry and against rape. But it was in 2003 when I wrote the, my first book on disability, gender disability and identity, that one of the articles written by an uh, Australian woman, Michelle LaFontaine, really, really highlighted something that had been part of the disability movement but still there was uh, very little understanding on it in terms of academic writings. And I think Michelle brought forward not only the question of perfect bodies linked to the market which had been part of feminist thought but also perfect bodies linked to sexuality and asexuality. Malini Chip who worked in my second book called the uh, disability, gender and the trajectories of power talks a lot about sexuality and asexuality and I'm sure my co panelist Nidhi will also talk about it. But this has a number of uh, repercussions. One is not only that um, you are saying that uh, women uh, with disabilities are asexual because they do not have perfect bodies, but also the law in India for instance allows euthanasia because under the act, the Japti um, Conceptual Act, which um, allows abortion only on the basis of having a disabled, a disabled child. Now this is something, um, you know, that legally that is allowed and it is a type of euthanasia and only of disabled children. Now this is something that um, 
is very difficult for women uh, to to understand or to accept. But at the same time, it is also linked to the question, as I said, of asexuality and sexuality. Mm. And because if you are have a perfect body, then you are sexual. If you are not, then asexual. But then the, the question arises that if you are asexual, then why is there so much of rape of young women with uh, disabilities? And the data that we have is only anecdotal data, but it shows a very, very high disregard for women's body who are, you know, especially children who are disabled. And this has led to many, many parents uh, deciding to sterilize their young girls. So this forced sterilization is again another human rights uh, abuse. So you don't only have your abortion, you have forced sterilization. And because you are in the search for a perfect body, and also in the recent years, it has also been highlighted in many, many uh, of your campaigns, and that has been part of my second book on psychosocial disability, linking it to the perfect mind. So you not only need perfect bodies, you also need perfect minds. Otherwise, you do not fit into the normal category. Now, this has been something that has led to a number of women being forcefully detained in institutions. And uh, Shanta Rao Variga, who came to India and did a wonderful study for Human Rights Watch um, on uh, forced detention, uh, on how women are ill-treated within the, the institutions that are there. It is where Shanta is concerned. Uh, she not only highlighted this issue, but she also was part of the team responsible for bringing about a network which has been working so uh, broadly on and deeply on the issues of violence against women. And that is the International Network of Women with Disabilities, which is today one of the leading uh, international uh, networks which works on violence against women. Uh, and uh, Maya, uh, Kowari, who has been uh, very, very ably leading this uh, organization, has uh, uh, highlighted uh, in all the network discussions that we've had on legal capacity, um, my own discussions at Bhagavad Dhawar with Tina Minkovitz shows how women with disabilities have, if they have a psychosocial disability, do not have legal capacity. To overcome all this, in the last, uh, to overcome all this in the last uh, one year, uh, I have been uh, joined by other women with disabilities on uh, a campaign that we have launched in India called Azadi Ki Uran in Hindi, which means flight to freedom. And we are fighting against uh, these three forced abortion, forced sterilization, and forced detention to which women with disabilities are exposed. And I invite you during the 16 days of violence against women, we'll be um, using the Twitter. So please, please do join us. I come in finally to the. Um, this is something in uh, violence against women which is extremely high and which we have tried to fight against. Uh, I uh, helped uh, to establish the network of women with disabilities in India, which uh, did the alternate report or two on India and put it forward to the CEDAW committee and which showed that extraordinary amount of violence that women with disabilities are faced with. It's not only uh, psychological or it is not only uh, physical or sexual, but it is also economic, which legal capacity shows us. Now, for in taking this forward, uh, has been also a part of a personal journey, because when I was 10 years old, I remember an aunt of mine died we used to play together. I was about 10 and she was 17. And when she died, we didn't know what it was. Then many, many years later, when again 
another death took place and another death in the family, that it was a bipolar disorder, which is because of high depression, which leads to a large amount of uh, people committing suicide. My young niece at the moment has that. So it has been part of our family, part of what uh, we live with, and um, it is a disability which is not recognized. It is a disability which is uh, um, invisible. It is a disability which uh, I think the world does not know and also ignores to a large extent. So for those who have this disability, violence is an everyday affair. And uh, I thank you for allowing me to uh, giving me the space to talk to you and uh, I hope that the Skype comes through and then we can meet and talk a little bit about if you want any other uh, issues to be discussed or some questions that you may have. Thank you so much. See, I'm very impatient. Well, that was really, really interesting. The kind of things that she's raising are things that we think are, are hugely important. Three areas she talked about at the end there was forced abortion, forced sterilization, forced detention, and these things are alive across the world. It's always shocking to think about how disabled young people are abused, sexually abused, but it is, as she sh shows from the work that she's done, very common and very common across the world, in fact. So. Okay, that's lovely. So we now turn to our panel in the room, and I've got my speakers all in order.